Okay, quick recap from part one. Our culture is based on agile principles. All engineering happens in squads, and we try to keep them loosely coupled and tightly aligned. We like cross-pollination and have an internal open source model for code. Squads do small and frequent releases, which is enabled by decoupling. Our self-service model minimizes the need for handoffs, and we use release trains and feature toggles to get stuff into production early and often. And since culture is all about the people, we focus on motivation, community, and trust, rather than structure and control. That was part one. And now, I'd like to talk about failure. Our founder, Daniel, put it nicely. We aim to make mistakes faster than anyone else. The idea is, to build something really cool, we will inevitably make some mistakes along the way. But each failure is also a learning. So if we fail fast, we learn fast, and therefore improve fast. It's a strategy for long-term success. It's like with kids. You can keep a toddler in the crib and she'll be safe. But she won't learn much and won't be very happy. If you instead let her run around and explore the world, she'll fail and fall sometimes, but she'll be happier and develop faster. And the wounds, well, they usually heal. So Spotify is a fail-friendly environment. We focus more on failure recovery than failure avoidance. Our internal blog has articles like Celebrate Failure and stories like How We Shot Ourselves in the Foot. Some squads even have a fail wall where people show off their failures and learnings. Failing without learning is, well, just failing. So when something goes wrong, we follow up with a post-mortem. This is never about whose fault was it. It's about what happened, what did we learn, what will we change. Post-mortems are actually part of our incident management workflow. So an incident ticket isn't closed when the problem is solved. It's closed when we've captured the learnings to avoid the same problem in the future. Fix the process, not just the product. In addition, all squads do retrospectives every few weeks to talk about what's working well and what to improve next. All in all, Spotify has a strong culture of continuous improvement, driven from below and supported from above. Failure must be non-lethal, or we don't live to fail again. So we promote the concept of limited blast radius. The architecture is quite decoupled, so if a squad makes a mistake, it will usually only impact a small part of the system and not bring everything down. And since the squad has end-to-end -end responsibility for their stuff without handoffs, they can usually fix the problem fast. Also, most new features are rolled out gradually, starting with just a tiny percent of all users and closely monitored. Once the feature proves to be stable, we gradually roll it out to the rest of the world. So if something goes wrong, it normally only affects a small part of the system for a small number of users for a short period of time. This limited blast radius gives squads courage to do lots of small experiments and learn really fast, instead of wasting time trying to predict and control all risk in advance. Mario Andretti puts it nicely. If everything's under control, you're going too slow. All right, let's talk about product development. Our product development approach is based on lean startup principles and is summarized by the mantra, think it, build it, ship it, tweak it. The biggest risk is always building the wrong thing. So before building a new product or major feature, we try to define a narrative, kind of like a press release or elevator pitch showing off the benefits. For example, radio you can save or follow your favorite artist. We also create prototypes to get a sense of what the feature might feel like and define hypotheses. How will this feature impact user behavior and our core metrics? Will they share more music? Will they log in more often? Whenever possible, we put real prototypes in front of real users. Once we feel confident this thing is worth building, we go ahead and build an MVP, minimum viable product. Just enough to fulfill the narrative, but far from feature complete. You might call it the minimum lovable product. Anyway, the real learning happens once we put something into production, so we want to get there as quickly as possible. Again, we deploy the MVP to just a few percent of all users and use techniques like A-B testing to measure the impact and test our hypotheses. The squad monitors the data and continues tweaking and redeploying until they see the desired impact. Then they gradually roll out to the rest of the world while taking the time needed to sort out practical stuff like operational issues and scaling. By the time the product or feature is fully rolled out, we already know it's a success. Because if it isn't, we don't roll it out. Impact is always more important than velocity, so a feature isn't considered done until it has achieved the desired impact. So with all this experimentation going on, how do we actually plan? How do we know what's going to be released by which date? Well, the short answer is we mostly don't. We care more about innovation than predictability. And 100% predictability means 0% innovation. On a scale, we'd probably be somewhere around here. Of course, sometimes we do need to make delivery commitments, 
like for partner integrations or marketing events. And that sometimes involves standard agile planning techniques like velocity and burn-up charts. But if we have to promise a date, we generally defer that commitment until the feature is already proven and close to ready. By minimizing the need for predictability, squads can focus on delivering value instead of being a slave to someone's arbitrary plan. One product owner said, I think of my squad as a group of volunteers that are here to work on something they are super passionate about. An amazing new product always starts with a person and a spark of inspiration, but it will only become real if people are allowed to play around and try things out. So we encourage everyone to spend about 10% of their time doing hack days or hack weeks. That's when people get to experiment and build whatever they want, no limits. Like this Dial a Song product, basically a Spotify enabled analog phone. Just dial the number of the song you want to listen to. Is it useful? Doesn't matter. The point is, if we try enough ideas, we're bound to strike gold from time to time. And quite often, the knowledge gained is worth more than the actual hack itself. Plus, it's fun. In addition, twice per year, we do a Spotify-wide hack week. Hundreds of people hacking away for a whole week. The mantra is, make cool things real. Do whatever you want, with whoever you want, in whatever way you want. And then we have a big demo and party on Friday. It's amazing how much cool stuff can be built in just a week with this kind of creative freedom, whether it's a helicopter made of lollipop sticks or a whole new way of discovering music. It turns out that innovation isn't really that hard. People are natural innovators, so just get out of their way and let them try things out. As you notice, we have an experiment-friendly culture. Tool A or Tool B? Let's try both and compare. Do we really need sprint planning meetings? Don't know. Let's skip a few and see if we miss them. Should this button be in the middle or in the corner? Let's try both an A-B test. Even the Spotify-wide hack week started as an experiment, and now it's part of our culture. So instead of arguing an issue to death, we talk about things like, what's the hypothesis? What did we learn? And what will we try next? This gives us more data-driven decisions and less opinion-driven, ego-driven, or authority-driven decisions. Although we are happy to experiment and try different ways of doing things, our culture is very waste-repellent, or lean if you prefer. That means people will quickly stop doing anything that doesn't add value. If it works, keep it. Otherwise, dump it. For example, some things that work for us so far are retrospectives, daily stand-ups, Google Docs, Git, and Guild on conferences. And some things that don't work for us are time reports, handoffs, separate test teams or test phases, and task estimates. We mostly just don't do these things. We are also strongly allergic to useless meetings and anything remotely near corporate BS. One common source of waste is what we call big projects. Basically anything that requires a bunch of squads to work tightly coordinated for several months. Big project means big risk, so we are organized to minimize the need and instead try to break projects into a series of smaller efforts. However, sometimes a big project is necessary, and in those cases we found some practices to be essential. Visualize progress using various combinations of physical and electronic boards. Do a daily sync meeting, where all squads involved meet up to resolve dependencies. Do a demo every week or two, where all the pieces come together so we can evaluate the integrated product together with stakeholders. These practices reduce risk and waste because of the improved collaboration and short feedback loop. We've found that a project also needs a small, tight leadership group to keep an eye on the big picture. Typically a tech lead, product lead, and sometimes a design lead. No project manager role so far but that might change. In general, we're still experimenting a lot with how to do big projects, and we're not so good at it yet. One of our big challenges is growth pain. As we grow, we risk falling into chaos, but if we overcompensate and add too much structure and process, we risk getting stuck in bureaucracy instead, and that's even worse. So the key question is really, what is the minimum viable bureaucracy? The least amount of structure and process we can get away with to avoid total chaos. Both sides cause waste, but in different ways, so the waste repellent culture and agile mindset helps us stay balanced. The key thing about reducing waste is to visualize it and talk about it often. So in addition to retrospectives and postmortems, many squads and tribes have improvement boards that show things like what's blocking us and what are we doing about it. We also like to talk about definition of awesome. For example, awesome for this squad means things like really finishing stuff, easily ramping up new team members, and no recurring tasks or bugs. And our definition of awesome architecture includes, I can build, test, and ship my feature within a week. I use data to learn from it, and my improved version is live in week two. Awesome is a direction, 
not a place. So it doesn't always have to be realistic. But if we can agree on what awesome would look like, it helps focus our improvement efforts and track progress. Here's an example of an improvement tracking board inspired by a technique called Toyota Improvement Kata. Top left shows what is the current situation. In this case, the squad was having quality problems. Bottom left shows definition of awesome. In a perfect world, we'd have no quality problems at all. Top right is a realistic target condition. If we were one step closer to awesome, what would that look like? And finally, the bottom right shows the next three concrete actions that will move us towards the target condition. As these get done, new actions are identified by the squad. Boards like this live on the wall in the squad room and are typically followed up at the next retrospective. All right, I realize that maybe this video makes it seem like everything at Spotify is just great. Well, truth is, we have plenty of problems to deal with, and I could give you a long list of pain points. But I won't, because it would go out of date quickly. We grow fast and change fast, and quite often, a seemingly brilliant solution today will cause a nasty new problem tomorrow, just because we've grown and everything is different. However, most problems are short-lived, because people actually do something about them. This company is pretty good at changing the architecture, process, organization, or whatever is needed to solve a problem. And that's really the key point. Healthy culture heals broken process. Since culture is so important, we put a lot of effort into strengthening it. This video is just one small example. No one actually owns culture, but we do have quite a lot of people focusing on it. Groups such as People Operations, and about 30 or so Agile coaches spread across all squads. And we do boot camps, where new hires form a temporary squad. They get to solve a real problem, while also learning about our tech stack and processes, and learning to work together as a team, all in one week. It's like cultural shock therapy. They often manage to put code into production in that time, which is impressive. But again, failing is okay, as long as they learn. Mainly though, culture spreads through storytelling. Whether it happens on the blog, at a post-mortem, a demo, or at lunch. As long as we keep sharing our successes and failures and learnings with each other, I think the culture will stay healthy. At the end of the day, culture in any organization is really just the sum of everyone's attitudes and actions. You are the culture, so model the behavior you want to see. That's it. I hope you enjoyed this story. Thanks for listening. Thank you.